The law of the jungle has always been the survival of the fittest. And one of the fittest of all beasts is the striped species that has been prowling the AFC as its defending king of the jungle. The Cincinnati Bengals come into Baltimore's Memorial Stadium as one of the ranking powers in pro football. And coach Forrest Gregg is certainly one reason for their success. Gregg took a talented team that lacked direction, successfully blending youngsters with veterans. Players like second-year wide receiver Chris Collinsworth, last season's Rookie of the Year, have worked nicely with older stars, coming up with the perfect balance of youth and experience. On offense, the leadership role falls to quarterback Ken Anderson, last season's Player of the Year. Anderson was once maligned, as was the team he played for, but a conference championship and a fistful of passing records have made him and Cincinnati winners. So the Bengals are fat cats, vibrant and healthy, but such is not the case with Frank Cush's Colts, who might be considered an endangered species. The Colts are the only NFL team without a win, and despite the best efforts of rookie quarterback Mike Pagel, Baltimore has yet to score a point since the end of the NFL players' strike. Pagel is one of 18 first-year players on the Colt roster, and the lack of experience has certainly been a factor in Baltimore's 0-4 record. There is talent on the team, but the sea of fuzzy-cheeked faces provides a stark contrast to a veteran team like the Bengals. Today's game has all the makings of a classic mismatch, defending AFC champ against a bunch of guys who were thinking about midterms and fraternity parties less than a year ago. But funny things can happen around the NFL, and when you least expect it, an apparently down-and-out David can rise up and smite even the mightiest Goliath. Memorial Stadium, two teams from different worlds are ready to lock horns. The defending AFC champion Cincinnati Bengals and the young Baltimore Colts still looking for many answers. Perhaps they'll find some today in the NFL Game of the Week. On the first series of the game, the Bengal defense wanted to make it clear right off the bat that the Colts would find moving the football to be a difficult proposition. The Colts did not come close to scoring on their initial drive, but you have to crawl before you can walk. What Baltimore did achieve was three first downs, giving them some continuity on offense for the first time in three weeks. This 15-yard pass play from quarterback Mike Pagel to running back Cleveland Franklin, number 28, was significant. It put Baltimore in Cincinnati territory. So what you say? Last week in Buffalo, the Colts never even crossed the midfield strike. Franklin's catch smashed a mental as well as a physical barrier. But this was not going to be one of those miracle drives. Bengal nose tackle Wilson Whitley, number 75, saw to that by sacking Pagel and ending the march. This was an important series nonetheless. It proved that the Colts could move against Cincinnati. And after holding the Bengals on their first series, the Colts were off and running again. Fullback Randy McMillan, number 32, blasted over the left side for 11. And then on the very next play, scat back Curtis Dickey, number 33, tried the same thing. The results were even more impressive. The 25-yard pickup came as a result of two things, Dickey's blazing speed and a well-sustained block by tight end Tim Sherwin, number 83, who sealed his man Reggie Williams, number 57, to the outside, giving Dickey room to roam.
Having cracked the left flank successfully, Pagel rolled right soon after, and the result was something Baltimore fans had not seen since September 19th against the Miami Dolphins. A Colt touchdown. Number 80, Ray Butler, gathered it in to give Baltimore a surprising 7-0 lead over the heavily favored Bengals. Eight weeks of the strike and two shutouts since had been a long drought, but the spell had finally been broken, and it was Times Square on New Year's Eve in the cold end zone. Pagel's rollout kept him out of harm's way and had given his team their first point since the rule of King Charlemagne. Well, at least it seemed that long. So successful had Baltimore's offense been that the Bengals had barely a chance to touch the ball themselves. With five minutes to go in the first quarter, Cincinnati began their first good drive of the day. And it started with the pile driving running of the enormous Pete Johnson, number 46. Baltimore wasn't giving much ground deep, so Bengal quarterback Ken Anderson found targets underneath, such as tight end Dan Ross, number 89. Ross hit the dirt to make the catch, and then wide receiver Steve Kreider, number 86, took a dive for the toss as well. But the play didn't end there as Kreider turned the out pattern into a Bengal score. Kreider's heads-up play made it 7-6 Colts, and there it stayed as Baltimore blocked the point after attempt. With a slim lead, the Colts decided to follow the same tack as Cincinnati had, throw underneath to the tight end. Tim Sherwin found all the room he needed as the Colts appeared to be back on the move once more. But when Baltimore turned to the run this time, the results were not as gratifying. Cincinnati's defense closed in on Dickey and McMillan, shackling the two young runners for most of the rest of the half. Bengal defense was starting to pick up the tempo, and the game at this point was Cincinnati's for the taking. But the Cincy offense was not clicking. Normal routine completions were turning into dropped balls or almost interceptions. Whatever it was, this was not the crisp passing attack Bengals fans were accustomed to seeing. Something was rotten in Crab Cake Corners, and Cincinnati coach Forrest Gregg didn't like it one bit. With five minutes to go in the half, Gregg's team was struggling on offense. 
And then more trouble brewed when the cold offense started getting its legs back. Halfback Zachary Dixon, number 31, started the Baltimore drive with a solid run up the gut. At this point, the Colts were trying almost everything, and almost everything worked. Ray Butler followed his end around with a tough catch over the middle, and the Colts were knocking at the door again. Although the Bengals were finally able to stop Baltimore from scoring a touchdown, some strong running did set up a Mike Wood field goal from 33 yards out. The half ended with the Colts on top. Just staying competitive would probably have been enough after the rough start the Colts had endured. A four-point lead, well, that was astounding and puzzling to the favored Cincinnati Bengals, to say the least. Statistically, the Bengal offense had not been that badly outplayed in the first half. But fundamental lapses that don't show up in the stats were the key reason the normally explosive Bengals had scored only six points on the young Cole defense. As the third period got underway, Baltimore coach Frank Cush wondered if his defensive unit could keep pressuring Cincinnati quarterback Ken Anderson. It didn't take long to get an answer. Number 92 nose tackled James Hunter barged in on Anderson and sacked him on Cincinnati's first possession. Hunter is one of a myriad of little-known first-year Colts who is trying to ply a trade in the NFL. If Hunter can continue to beat double-team blocking as he did on plays like this, he won't have to worry about whether he'll be sticking around in the big leagues. Cincinnati turned the ball over to the Colts, but their offense couldn't get started either. So back it went to the Bengals. The higher education of the Colt defenders continued with a seminar on how to stop pro football's biggest runner. When all else fails in Cincy, let Pete Johnson do it. Johnson got the call, and he did it to the young Baltimore defense again and again and again. Johnson's rampages brought the ball down inside the five, where Ken Anderson called a quick slant out of the goal line allotment. Number 83 tight end M.L. Harris popped free, and the Bengals took their first lead of the day. A second look shows that the play worked because man in motion Dan Ross, fullback Johnson, and halfback Archie Griffin all took coverage to the right side. Harris crossed left and was surrounded by nothing but air. Now that Cincinnati was in the lead, many expected the Colts to fade quickly. But Pagel came up with yet another way to respond by rolling wide and keeping the ball himself. This got the Colts going again, but only temporarily. For the rest of the third period, the Bengals chased the Colts out of their offensive rhythm. Now that the Bengal offense was moving, the defense was even more ferocious, much to Baltimore's dismay.
Number 73, Eddie Edwards, picked up the sack on Pagel, ending an unproductive third quarter for the Colts. For the Bengals, however, things were just starting to get interesting. Anderson was finally on the same wavelength with his receivers, and his surgical darts began to carve up the young Colt defense. Just a few quick plays, the Bengals were within the Baltimore five again. Anderson then locked at a pass to Collinsworth, who managed to thrill the crowd without doing any changing on the scoreboard. The officials ruled the catch out of bounds, but a penalty on Baltimore made it first and goal on the one. Even though the play went for naught, it is certainly worth another look, if only to see Collinsworth at his best. Cincinnati had been in the same situation just minutes before, and lo and behold, the Colts were lining up in the same defense. So Anderson called the tight end slant once more, and once more, M.L. Harris was there to bring home the bacon. Harris's second touchdown of the day was a carbon copy of the first, but the Bengals were not about to be finicky at this point. By Cincinnati's own admission, the Colts had outplayed them. But now with 13 minutes to go, Harris had given the Bengals a 10-point lead, a lead they didn't think they'd have trouble holding. But the Colts were gearing up for one last run and just maybe pro football's biggest upset of the season. Baltimore knew they had moved most effectively by going for short gains, and there was certainly enough time to get back into the game this way. So the Colts played it slow and steady and made progress. Cleveland Franklin turned in the key play of the drive when on fourth and one in a short yardage situation, Franklin improvised and ended up 18 yards to the good. Just a few plays later, Pagel found rookie tight end Pat Beach, number 81, for the score. And still six and a half minutes remained in the game. Memorial Stadium, which has been somewhat sedate in the last year or so, was now very much alive. The fans sensed that they could be part of a great upset, so they cheered the defense on. The Colts heard their encouragement, and on defense, the kids were all right. Twice they stopped Bengal Drive, setting the stage for a dramatic finish. Rookies Johnny Cooks and Leo Wisniewski combined on the Anderson sack and turned the ball over to the Colt offense with 52 seconds to play. Baltimore had to go 73 yards against one of the toughest defenses in football, and the start of the drive was not good. But Pagel pulled the team together and showed remarkable poise as Baltimore began a steady march downfield. Curtis Dickey made one key reception, and then rookie Holden Smith, number 84, caught two others, including this one that put the ball on the Bengal 22 with only 10 seconds to play.
Baltimore called time and sent in Mike Wood for a 40-yard field goal attempt that would put the game into overtime. Up till now, the Colts had followed the script perfectly, but here the fairy tale ended. Wood's kick sailed wide left, and the clock ran out with the Bengals on top, 20 to 17. It was a disheartening finish for the young Colts, who had played their best game of the season. After two dreadful defeats, this effort restored some respect for pro football's youngest team. Perhaps that first win will come in the very near future. As for Forrest Gregg's Bengals, their record is now 4-1, and one, tied for the best in the AFC. But Gregg and his players knew they were fortunate to escape Baltimore with a win. Still, the Bengals won even on a bad day, and that's what good teams are supposed to do. Last year's champs are right on schedule as they close in on a berth in the AFC playoff tournament.